Welcome to the Activity Continues podcast, where a couple of dorks, Amy, that's me, and Megan. What's up, everybody? That's me. We discuss episodes of the Travel Channel's TV show, The Dead Files. So our last episode was a little bit longer than usual, and that's because we did a couple of things differently. Uh, One major thing is that we dug into the true crime aspect by doing a little research on the side about a crime that happened in relation to the story. Also, we did some in-the-moment digging, following up on the people in the episode of the show. Megan looked into the tattoo parlor, for instance. We like doing that. So the plan now is for us to do all that research ahead of time, as much as we can. And then as for the follow-ups, they'll be in the regular episode. But the true crime investigation will be a separate bonus episode that we will release on Patreon. So if you're interested in that aspect, come over and join our Patreon. There probably won't be a bonus episode each week because not all of the stories that we do involve a true crime, but we will be coming up with other extras to give patrons. If you have any ideas, please shoot them our way. And speaking of Patreon, we would love to welcome our very first member to the Patreon family, and it's... (gasps) Drum roll. Da, la, 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 la. <laughs> Melissa! Melissa! You know, the fabulously talented friend who wrote our gorgeous theme song. Welcome and thank you, Melissa. And listeners, if you haven't already listened to Melissa's podcast, do yourself a favor and check them out. A link to her website will be in the show notes. Every time I hear our intro, I, st- I love it so much. It's just... <laughs> it, oh. And the first time I heard it, literal goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I loved She's it. She's talented. Oh, she is so amazing. Love it. It's time for Amy's story. She is going first. Do, do, do. This is episode 12. I'm sorry. This is. <laughs> How many of those have you had? Much. <laughs> 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 My episode is Season 12, Episode 12. It originally aired on April 16th, 2020. So not too terribly long ago. This takes place in, oh, I'm sorry. And the episode title is The Craving. And I'm actually not sure why, because I didn't really make a connection. Maybe, maybe somebody else will. Maybe. It is located in Tucson, Arizona. The clients are Nick He's a retired cop, and he says they've lived there for about two and a half years. Mm -hmm. His wife is Desiree, and her aunt owned the property for 35 years before they owned it. Oh, okay. So it's been like it's not a new property to them. They're just new to living on it. Yes, yes. Okay. And they have four children. Their daughter, Natalie, is 17. They have a son, Brennan, who's 15. Another daughter, Trinity, who's 13. And Connor, who is nine. So not nearly as many kids as that lady from last time. I was just going to say it's no soccer team. So the family in general has experienced objects moving, shadow people, apparitions, physical attacks, and mimicking voices. I hate the mimicking voices. Yeah, that scares those are creepy. me so much. That is one of the things that I had in our old house. Yeah, you did. I. I would hear I would hear somebody saying Amy yep. in my ear. I couldn't tell if they were far away and oh, yelling God. or if they were right there and whispering. But and it actually this wasn't really a mimic thing because they they didn't sound like anybody I knew. Right. But it would be right there in my ear and it would wake me up or I'd be half asleep and I would hear it and I'm like what what what? And when I told my husband about it, of course he first thought I was crazy. And then a little while later he it heard it, him. but yeah. what he heard was it was mimicking me. <gasps> so he thought it was me and I was sleeping in a guest room because he was snoring. And so I was in the guest room just down the hall and he heard me calling to him. And so he got up and went in, into the guest room and I'm fast asleep. I hate this. I hate so, thanks. I hate it. I mm-hmm. don't know. Yeah. Mm-mm. Nope. It was scary. And but at least. I was validated. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, see, it's not just I wonder, me. was that, do you think that was kid? Oh. Or do you think it was another 
Like was can't? it another? Um, yeah, I don't know. Because was he been. kind of a was he a trickster or not so much? I I don't know. I think he kind of was. I mean, he was a bootlegger, so he had to have been a little bit of a yeah, I looking think he, for trouble. I think he was. Yeah, I mean, I think he was. I don't know if he was like a funny guy necessarily, mm-hmm. but but I mean, like, would he have been like a shit stir? You know, doing something. I feel like he would have been if I, he's a bootlegger. I feel like he would have been. It's hard so, to I say. I don't know. Those of you who yes. don't know who we're talking about, we're talking about a guy named Kid Can. That was his gangster name. His real name is Isidore Blumenfield. And he's a Minnesota gangster. He he was part of the Jewish mafia in Minneapolis in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. My other podcast, Volstead Land, is... Season one is all about him and his mm-hmm. cronies and all that. So just filling that in. Not necessarily a plug, but just to no. let you know that's what we're talking about. It all circles back. I just, I wonder, it would be really interesting to have had like a medium walk through your house, that old house. It would. It'd be great. I, I wish I still lived there. I would call the yeah, dead files, help me dead files and have yeah. him come over. Yeah. One thing I should mention is that the reason that I started that podcast is that our friend Melissa, songwriter, patron extraordinaire, she is sensitive. She doesn't call herself a medium or anything, but she sees things that other people don't. And oh she met Kid Can in our house mm-hmm. one time. I can't As imagine. we were getting ready to sell it. We so, should have her on the show. We should. Interview her. She's told that story. She told it on, on Volstead Land, but... And then I think she also told it on her podcast. So she's told the story a few times. I could link to the episode of Volstead Land where, yeah, where she told that story. So yeah, you I'll do that. She's the best. Yeah, she's cool. Okay. Anyway, I've, de- I've gotten us off topic enough. Okay. I'll be quiet now. Let's cycle back. Okay. So mimicking voices. Ugh. Nick, the father, is most concerned about Connor. That's the nine-year-old. He thinks that he's possibly possessed. <laughs> That's a bold statement to throw the P word around. Right. I know. Because, you know, I remember Amy saying it's extremely rare for there to be an actual possession. That's, yeah. And I know they've done a million episodes, but it's come up quite a bit, I have to say. But I wonder if they, like, what is considered possession, like full possession, you know, like, and is there like partial possession? Because I wonder if they, you know, because Amy said she uses words that people yeah. know. True. So true, true. may you know maybe uh, when they say possession, they might just mean influence by yeah. or, but you know people don't recognize that they they relate to a possession. Yeah, yeah. Just a thought. You're absolutely I right. That could be. Amy, let us know if you're listening. Oh, please be listening. <laughs> okay, so Nick says that Connor he hears Connor crying. And talking or kind of babbling, and he'll go into his room in the middle of the night, and Connor's sitting up in bed, talking to the closet. Nope. And he's speaking in like a gibberish language that he doesn't recognize, and he's speaking to somebody or something in the closet. (gasps) No, I literally stopped breathing right now. (laughs) Yeah. I don't like it. How horrifying, right? And... He's I'm... when he asks Connor who he's talking to, Connor says he can't tell him because if he does, it'll kill him. <gasps> I, oh, oh, oh. I'm about to start speaking my own gibberish out of fear. <laughs> We're coming right out of the gate with, with yeah, a, we are a good one. You're coming in hot today. <laughs> <laughs> I might need this 12 and a half AB yeah, to get through your story. Right? I know. I Maybe I should get something a little stronger. Here, take one of these. I still have three, two more, two or three more cans, depending on if I drink this other one. But I have you a couple drink more cans of this. You might need it to get through your story because <laughs> we're what five minutes in right now, and we're already, I know, and it's just boom. I'm literally on the fourth paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nick tells Steve that he was in the living room and felt two large hands on his back, and they pushed him off a step. It's just a small, like a. Uh, Sunken living room kind of a step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he said he's woken up with bruises and he has seen a bunch of different shadow people. I've seen probably around 10 different types of shadow figures myself. Sometimes there'll be a group 
and sometimes it's just like a parade. I wonder if they're doing that, could they be stuck on a loop, like spirits that mm. are on a loop that are continuously repeating an action over like and over. Like the residual? like Yeah, like a residual Yeah, energy. that's like a, a tape recorder just playing it over yeah, and over. Yeah, yep, yep. Could be. I did mix this up a little bit. I put a lot of the Steve stuff together and a lot of the Amy stuff together, even though they didn't happen exactly that way as you're watching yeah. it literally, lin- linearly. That's what I do. That's what I do. So. Yeah, I did. I did still do it back and forth, but I tried yeah. to make it not Amy, Steve, Amy, Steve, like uh, as it was. So here Amy begins her walk and right away she says she sees something hissing and growling. And here's one of them say skinwalker. No. She explains to Matt that a skinwalker is a deceased Native American who is or was a witch. And it imitates and takes on the forms of living people here. No, mm -mm, no, mm -mm, no. Like family members. Yeah, it's dangerous. I wonder if we'll uncover that that was built on a Native American burial ground. Oh, hang on. (laughs) Pretty much everything was. This whole place belonged to them before we came. Of course it did. She said it could take over people if it wanted to. It is a type of possession. Amy also sees shadow people walking across the room. They come in here at night and just watch. They watch the people. And she said, yeah, and they're not mentally stable. They torture the living people because it's fun. Oh, yeah, that's fun. Mm -hmm. That's top five favorite things to do. (laughs) What to do in Minneapolis. Yeah, if you're a shadow person. Actually, this is Tucson, so what Good. to do in Tucson. They're not here. Good. <laughs> so Steve is talking to the oldest daughter, Natalie. I think she said she was 17. 17, yeah. And she sees dark apparitions in the hallways. <gasps> Quick side note, I can do apparitions versus ghosts if you want to do now. Oh, you want, you want to do, do that now? Later. Yeah, since you said the word apparition. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Megan has this calendar. Yes, I have a like a rip off day calendar and it's like hauntings throughout the world. And sometimes it's like a haunting and other times it's a glossary. And so the glossary for Wednesday, the 23rd was apparition versus ghost. And so it says, quote, the words apparition and ghost are sometimes used as synonyms, but the two terms are not entirely equivalent. A ghost is the per- spirit of a deceased person or animal who has left its body yet remains on earth. An apparition is the term for the visible image of a ghost or spirit. An apparition can take many shapes. For instance, it can look just like a person, an indistinct figure, or a shapeless white blob. A ghost who manifests as a complete human or animal figure is called a full-bodied apparition. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So then daughter Trinity hears voices that sound like her parents. And Steve asked her what they say, and she said they mostly just call her name. Brennan has, it's the older son, has scratches on his stomach, and he agrees that Connor, the little one, is being picked on. So then he talks to little poor sweet Connor. Steve asks him if he's scared, and he says yes. Okay. I don't like it here. I remember seeing a shadow in the closet. I just always felt nervous about that closet. Oh, God. And he says that if Amy and Steve can't fix it, they're going to have to move. Now we see Amy in Connor's room, and she says they come in and out of the closet. And then she goes, ooh, that's not cool. And they're, she said they're getting physical with the kids. They're shoving them, nudging them. She said, I think they're really, they're really hurting these kids. They're really physically hurting these kids. And she said they like it when the kids cry. Oh, okay. And then she kind of like puts her hands over her head and she goes, Oh, this is upsetting. Yeah, Amy, it is. Yeah, I agree. Now, Steve is speaking with Nick's wife, Desiree, and she's also really worried about Connor. She has experienced male voices, no one she knows. But this one voice kept saying, help me. And it wanted her to go to the police and tell them that he's dead. And that his body is in the wash, which is out back of their house. They have, it's called the pan, the Pantano wash. What does that mean here in the wash? Behind our house, it's the Pantano wash, where water will flow when we have monsoons. Sure. So 
he says his body was in the wash. Six months later, they did find a body in the wash. No, thank you. Yeah. It was a male, and Steve is interested to see if there's a connection, and I'll come back to this. Everyone's moods have declined. They're depressed, angry, etc. And none of this was like this before they moved here. Steve, talking to Desiree, Desiree said that her aunt bought the house early in the 1970s. And that was a bad time. (laughs) There's lots of serial killers. Uh, Oh, yeah. Oh, lots of and and uh, alien abductions. I just watched the Mm -hmm. Travis, Travis Walton story. That first I watched Fire in the Sky, the movie about the guy being abducted in 1975. Yeah. And then I watched a documentary on Discovery about it, too. It was good. Okay, so the aunt bought the house in the early 1970s and brought her mother, Desiree's grandmother, in from Europe, and she lived with, they lived together. Mm-hmm. The aunt was very maternal and nurturing, and grandma was a she, called a, she called her a spitfire, who, quote, could light up a room with her jokes and her stories. No. So I think not, you know what's coming. No, not light up a room. Yeah. Grandmother died from a slip and fall in the bathtub, but she was a hundred, so okay, you know it's she had a good life, yeah, or she had a long life anyway. I guess I don't know if it yeah. was any good. <laughs> <laughs> she sounded she sounded cool, don't, so I'm sure she's fine. Don't make assumptions about her <laughs> life. <laughs> and Steve says that must have been rough for you and your aunt. And she says that she and her aunt had a falling out because Desiree thinks the aunt had something to do with grandmother's death. So did you confront your aunt on this? I did. Her and I had a conversation before she passed. The first thing she said to me was, I didn't do it on purpose. (gasps) Okay, how do you accidentally push somebody? Uh, I don't know. So Desiree feels that the aunt was really frustrated with being her mom's caretaker, so she's not sure how accidental this was. Yeah. Uh, The aunt died in the house a few years later, and they never talked about how she died. Mm -hmm. So now we go back to Amy. She sees a woman here who is crying a lot. She's in her 50s. The living people would have experiences. She, the dead lady, is an empath, so she can put her emotions into another person. Mm-hmm. And people would feel the weight of the guilt, like a oh. knot in their stomach or a heavy heart. And this crying woman has curly black hair. Her death is recent, within the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. And she feels guilt and sadness. And then other people are feeling that because of her. Yeah. She feels like she put people in a bad situation. And Amy doesn't see how she died. Okay. So now we go back to Desiree and she's in her room in her bedroom, talking about how she's been scratched in the bed. She shows pictures of scratches that she has. And she also showed a picture of something on her foot that looked like a burn. Mm -hmm. She said it it raised up, welted up like a burn. Wow. Mm -hmm. Are they like, just like one scratch? Or are they three scratches when they're showing them? I don't, I don't remember it looking like a claw or anything. Yeah. Okay. But she, they experienced thumping and tapping on the walls and the window. And Steve had her demonstrate what it sounded like. And she the, on the walls, it sounded like knocking. And on the glass, it was just like a finger tap. God, stop And it went it. like tap, tap, yep. tap. Oh, God. Tap, tap, tap. Oh, God. Yeah. Steve said, what do you think it wants? And she said, it wants to hurt us. Oh, my God. So now Amy's in the bedroom. And she says she doesn't like the bed there. And I think she means she doesn't like the position of the bed in the mm-hmm. room. Mm-hmm. And she says there is something outside that's sticking his head and arms through the window and is trying to pull a living person through the window it wants to take the person and matt says what is it what is it and she says it's a wendigo Ooh. and she's confused because they're in arizona and she yeah. said wendigos are usually really far north yeah in uh nova scotia like in, Canada. yeah like in like the woods aren't they i think so yeah so and matt asked her how to you know to explain what a wendigo is and she said it's a supernatural entity that can look different ways but is usually some sort of a man animal thing Mm -hmm. and they like to kill and eat people. So now Steve is uh, investigating in town, and he was called by a historian named Bridget Lefevre. She had some info on this Yaki tribe Mm -hmm. that lived there. Mm -hmm. They were very spiritual. 
They believe the universe is on a lot of different planes. Mm -hmm. They're very territorial and would fight to the death. Great. So here's actually something kind of nice. The American government helped this tribe. They gave them a ton of land in in Tucson. Okay. The American government did back then and protected it for them. Nice. That's something you don't hear every day. Yeah, I know. Steve said that, too. He's like, that's really refreshing to hear that the American government actually did him a solid for once. Not his words. I just... You, that. you paraphrased. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so then go to Amy and she says, "This is, there's an enormous amount of land that is theirs. There's a lot of Native Americans here and it is extremely sacred land. Mm-hmm. They made sure she understood it was an extremely sacred piece of land. The skinwalker was there first... And he still walks through it all. And it's not only at this house. It's a very wide Mm -hmm. area where this is going on. Do they have neighbors that this might be happening to as well? They didn't talk to any of the neighbors. But, I mean, yeah, their house is next door. It's not like they're out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, if he's going or if the skinwalker is going to, you would think that other houses would have the same issues. Yep, you would. So Steve now is looking into the dead body in the wash, right? Mm -hmm. And he said that a whole bunch of bodies have turned up here. Oh, super. Yeah. He meets with, I I don't know who this woman, what her role is, but her name is Amy Ehrman. And she gives him info about one case in particular that stood out to her. The guy's name was Carl Martin. They found him in July of 1986, 3,500 feet from the client's house. The body was wrapped in sheets, his head was wrapped in plastic, and the body was badly decomposed. It was summer in Arizona, so you can only imagine how that smelled. Yeah. But now I'm thinking this can't be the person that Desiree Mm -mm. was talking to, because that was in 1986, and she didn't live there in 1986. Now, she could have been visiting her aunt, but she never said this happened when she was 10 or whatever, you know? So I think that this is not him. But like like Steve said, there's a ton of people. Mm-hmm. There's, I did a Google search, and there are probably at least 10 stories about bodies Ow. in that wash alone. So, yeah. Are they all, like, homicides? Or oh, yeah. do they not? Oh, they, yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, there was one that was a girl, a younger girl, and I think they thought that one might be an accident. I didn't dig into them all. I just yeah. like looked at the headlines. But So Carl, the victim, he was on parole. He had been in prison for forging checks. And he was under police surveillance because he owned an automobile shop that the police believed was a chop shop. Mm-hmm. So the police had been watching him. And they noticed that he just wasn't showing up at the chop shop for a while. How did he go missing if the police were watching him? Well, they weren't watching that carefully. I guess not. So then the wife reported him missing. And then a while later, so wait, this happened in, he was found in July. March was when they noticed he went missing. And that's when his wife uh, reported him missing. So then they got a tip that they should speak to a man named Richard Hale. He was a friend and a coworker of the victim. He worked at that chop shop. He was a mechanic. He tells them that Martha the wife, was having an affair with their roommate, Ronald Gomez. Martha! I know. So the wife, Gomez, and Hale, they believed that they were being cheated out of their share of money proceeds from the chop shop. Mm -hmm. So on March 12th of 1986, Hale shot Carl Martin while he was sleeping. It did not kill him. Shot him in the head. Did not kill him. We got a Rasputin on our hands. <laughs> so then Gomez goes in and empties the gun into Carl. He's still not dead. Hits him in the head with a sledgehammer a few times. He's still not dead. So he strangles Jeez. him. Jeez. Oh, this poor man. I know. Can you imagine? I'd rather not. So Hale, the one who shot first, that one, one shot, he cuts a plea agreement. And ends up serving 15 years, and then he testifies against the other guys. Mm -hmm. Martha Mm -hmm. got life in prison, but she was out on parole in 1998. So she only served 10 years years. by the time. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Gomez had two mistrials, and then the prosecutor decided not to go to a third trial. So he didn't get anything. So the guy that did all of that shit got nothing. Wow. Yep. Yay, justice system. Wow. And now this is a case, that case was interesting to me, and so I Googled it, and I newspapers.com'd it, and I found out a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay. Which we will save for another time. Yep. Yep. Subscribe. Pay for us. Subscribe. It's only a dollar a month, you guys. That's $12. Yeah. My shitty coffee was 15. Yeah, it's worth it. It is. We're hilarious, as you know. (laughs) That's what we like to tell ourselves anyway. And modest, too. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so Amy's outside the building now. She sees a male with a head wound and damage around his neck. And she said he has weird ashy colored skin and he is trapped in that body. I assume that that's Carl. Yeah. But I still don't think that's the one that Desiree was talking to. I don't think so either. So this person that Amy sees, he lets her know that. Uh, And he's trapped in his body. He indicated that he's not the issue here. It's the monster. Oh, super. Yeah. Love that. So now Steve's at the History Museum, and he discovers a deadly plane crash. The pilot of this plane crash used to rent the house. His name was Norman Hurst. He was born in New Jersey. He went to Virginia Tech and the Air Force Base. He was a very good pilot, did a whole bunch of missions. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there was a plane crash. Mm -hmm. He died. So they think that he might be somebody that Amy might see. Yeah. The plane crashed into what they called an Indian reservation, but uh, Native American American. reservation. Hearst died. His trainee was in the plane with him, and the trainee had barely a scratch. Really? Wow. Yeah. The uh, results of the investigation are classified. So they don't say how or why he would have. He was a very good pilot. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for him to just lose control. So I don't know what happened. But mysterious circumstances yeah. could be like the the pilot. I know way too many true crime things or paranormal stuff, but the flight class in Florida that went for a flight, um, a, a routine like flight. The instructor took students out and mm-hmm. um, they left from their Air Force base and they were never seen again. What? Yeah. Uh, Never crashed or anything? They just disappeared? They, The lead pilot got confused. His instruments weren't reading correctly. And he, they think he was flying. He, they think that he thought he was flying. Okay, so it's in Florida. They think that he thought he was on the Gulf side of Florida. And so he was flying east. But really what they think happened is he was closer to the Atlantic side. And so he okay. was flying east, away from land. Oh, it's really so he probably in- crashed in the ocean. Yeah, but they and they they sent but out they, find it. they sent out other search planes that vanished too. What? Yeah, it's. I'll have to send you the the. Oh, interesting. It's Supernatural by Daisy Egan. Oh. She covers it. It's okay. a really interesting case. And the, the lead pilot tried to get somebody else to take it because he said he had a bad feeling about it. He said he didn't want to go up. Oh, no. And this was a very seasoned pilot. And and he tried, literally the last minute, he tried to get out of it. And his supervisor was like, you, I don't have a, that's not a good reason. Oh, jeez. Yeah. But the supervisor felt pretty stupid after that. Yeah, I mean, they lost a lot of people looking for them. Oh, God. I'll have to look that up. Yeah. I do subscribe to Daisy Egan podcast I after you mentioned podcast, it that time. Yeah. I've only listened to one episode, but I really liked it. But yeah. I'll go dig around in there and find it. Sorry, I know that was a tangent, but that's just kind of what it that's reminded okay. me of, of like yeah. this really seasoned yeah. pilot just, you know, something happens and they crash a plane and yeah. then it's classified. That makes it's interesting. Yeah. Anyway, sorry to, sorry. No, no problem. Okay, so now we're at the sketch, and Amy says that the two people that concerned her the most are the Wendigo, which she explained as a clear energy in a contained form, the one that's coming through the window, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the woman that was crying. 
the okay. petite, heavy set lady with the dark curls. Yep. Okay, so now we're at the reveal. <laughs> I noted that Steve sounds like he has a cold. <laughs> <laughs> so Amy brings up first the male in his late 30s to 40s. She was in his body. She felt the impact to his head, felt her the brain being injured. And she felt being shot. She said the body was in a very bad state of decomposition. And then Steve talks about Carl Martin, mm-hmm. who was 45, shot and left to decompose out in the wash. He tells them the story that the historian told him that we already went over. Yeah. I looked up the Pantano wash and I found a video showing how the water rushes through there mm-hmm. after a storm. And it's terrifyingly fast. Is it really? It's like a fast, fast river. It looks really scary. Yeah. Uh, I'll post a link to the video. I think you can people see it, forget I... how vicious water is. Because we oh think my God, of like. It's so powerful. Yeah. I mean, you think of like, you know, lakes or creeks or rivers, mm-hmm. you know, they're slow, but even then you get the undercurrent. And mm-hmm. if, like, if you, yeah, they can be brutal. Yep. And the guy in the video is saying that too. He's like, people don't realize how bad it is that they walk out into it. They're going to. They're gone. Yeah. Swept away. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to die. Yeah. Because it's not just the water on top you got to worry about. Yeah. It's the undercurrent. Yeah. Yeah. And so I can see why people put bodies out there because yeah. probably not going to get found. Right. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of them were found. So imagine all the ones that. That weren't. weren't. Yeah. So Desiree tells her story about the man coming to her, and Amy says she thinks it's him. But again, it can't be Carl. Mm-hmm. Unless, unless, like I said, maybe this happened to Desiree in 1986, and she just didn't say that. You know, mm-hmm. I got the impression it was something that happened when the her right when lived they there. lived there. Yeah, like within yeah. the last two years. That's what I would right. get too. Right. Especially because you says six months later. They yeah. found a body, so I would assume yeah. it, that's it had to have been f- who she heard was that person. Yeah, but yeah, you know what they say about assumptions. So then she, uh, Amy, talks about the petite female with the curly hair. She's connected to this house. She's very present here. They cut to Desiree, who just stiffens because she knows that it's her aunt, her family member. Yep. She said, the dead woman feels responsible for what is going on here. Amy says they feel her emotions. Desiree explains that grandma passed away in 2007 and that the aunt did it. And Amy gasps. Oh, my God. I love her reactions. (laughs) I know. Sometimes she's just like, like her eyes just go. Yeah. 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 She uh, Desiree talks about the aunt and how much she taught her. And they show a picture of her aunt and her grandmother together. They look alike. So mm-hmm. they think it's the grandmother that is in the house. But sounds more like the aunt. I thought it sounded like the aunt too. Because why would because she feel why guilty? Would she be sad. Yeah. She didn't kill anybody. I think it's of. the aunt. Doesn't make any sense for it to be the grandma. Yeah, maybe mm-hmm. the grandma's a serial killer. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, who knows? So Steve Maybe she's she- trying to throw us off. I don't yeah. light up a room here. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve shows the picture of the two ladies and asks Amy if one of them could be who she saw. And she said, well, I had a sketch done. Well, I had a sketch done. Imagine that, Steve. And Steve whips it out, puts it down. And let me says he get he says, oh, you're not going to want to see this. Not this time, no. Not for oh, that okay, one. Okay, I okay. think he might have said no, it for okay, the next one. Okay. Because this is just a sketch of an of an older lady. I'm going to send you right now the sketch and then the picture of the Ooh. ladies, of the lady that she oh saw. Oh, my God. And they said. Oh, yeah. That's the grandma. Is, that's Yeah. You think so? I think it looks. They look like sisters. They do. So honest to God, they look like sisters. The grandma's the one in the red shirt. Mm-hmm. She was 100 in that picture. It was her birthday. She looks like she's maybe 70. I know. Yeah, I would say that's the grandma. That looks like the grandma to me. Yeah. I don't know. It just seems weird. But she, anyway. The ghost looks like a heavy smoker, whatever. Yes. They said, that's your grandma's nose. That Nick said to Desiree, that's your grandma's nose. And then they both said at the same time, and the smoker's mouth. <laughs> the, mm-hmm. the, uh, I'm glad I quit smoking when I did. Yeah. Oh. 
So the other thing she's worried about is the dead people who show themselves as shadow people. So they're not true shadow people. And she says, uh, oh, and so when she when she says they show themselves as shadow people, Steve and Nick shoot each other knowing glances. Mm -hmm. She says they're very invasive and intrusive. They're in the bathroom watching. No, thank and you. In the master Can I bedroom. Shower in I know. peace, you guys. You're never alone. I mean, really, you're Listen, never alone. Look at this, you guys. Nobody's wanting to see this naked. So <laughs> just wait outside until I have my bathrobe on at least. Yeah. Yeah. Really? I, ugh, the thought of ugh, mm -mm. just don't I think don't about like. It. Mm -mm. So she says they're in the bedroom. Or no, sorry. In the master bedroom, they stand around the bed and watch. And then Nick talks about the seeing the parade of them. And Amy says, yeah, yeah. she said that they're not mentally stable. Great. Yeah. What's worse than ghosts? Not mentally stable ghosts. Right. Just when you thought it couldn't get any more fun. <laughs> so Amy says that in the boys bedroom, they're coming out of the closet. And dad says, son of a bitch. In the bedroom at the very end of the hall. That's the boys' bedroom. the right. In that room, they were coming out of the closet. Son of a Yeah. Same, dad. Same. Yeah. Yep. And then he describes how Connor sits up in bed, is talking to somebody in a funny language, and says he can't tell who it is or they'll kill him. And he also gets scratches and... Steve shows the photos of the kids' scratches. And Desiree says, I want to kill them. These are my babies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't. Well, you can't kill them because they're dead. But You're right. Yeah, I 100% would be the same. Yep. Of course. Oh. Amy talks about the natives there, and there are two monsters connected to them. The Skinwalker and the Wendigo. The Skinwalker mimics humans. And Nick talks about how he hears his wife or kids calling to him. And then when he goes to find out what they want, they're like, well, it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. Then she talks about the Wendigo. She doesn't know how it got here, but it has bad intentions. It focuses on the master bedroom and it wants the female. She explains how it wants to pull the woman out of the window. And they cut to Nick, who is just getting more and more pissed by the second. Yeah. But I did have a sketch done of what I saw. This is just great. Great, Steve. Love it. Yeah. Then they show the picture and the Nick, the dad, says. What the f*** is that? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. I googled Wendigo images. You guys don't do this at night in your basement. Mm -mm. Do it in the daytime. In the sun. Do it in the sun. Here comes the sun. Do, 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 do. Here comes the sun. And I said. Okay, here's the picture. Do I want to see this, Amy? You know what? It's a really creepy idea. Mm -hmm. The sketch itself is almost like a kid drew it. Oh, okay. you know? All right. That makes me. Yeah. So I don't think it's that creepy. It's a Ooh, creepy. No, that's. It's a creepy idea for sure. That's a terrible sketch. I <laughs> that it's reaching through the window to try and pull this woman out. Right. Yeah. It's hideous. And I like how the person drew the curtains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's not it's not a uh, very advanced. The Google images of Wendigo are much more terrifying oh, I than bet. this. I'll I'll screenshot and send. Oh them yeah, then yeah. I'll put those mm -hmm. in the socials too. So they say they hear banging and noises, and they talk about the scratches and the burns that that Desiree is getting, and mm -hmm. Amy gets even more worried. Amy explains mm -hmm. that the Wendigo wants to take her away and kill her and eat her. This Wendigo, if it got a hold of her, what could happen? Its intentions is to take you away, and then it would kill you and eat you. Super. And Nick says, over my dead body. Don't say that, Nick. And I'm like, hang up there, pal. You don't know what you're dealing with here yet. And then Steve says, you guys got a lot of shit going on here. <laughs> 
<laughs> Steve, you are straight to the point. I love it. <laughs> Nick is very pissed now and he says, Bring it on. I'm going to give this a run for his money. Okay, here's the thing, people. Don't challenge these things because no, I wouldn't. Y- y- they don't have anything to lose. They're dead. You have a family to lose, your life. Exactly. That don't you know what I learned from my ex husband is never challenge somebody to a fight who has less to lose than you do. Absolutely. And this thing does not have anything to lose. That's right. Don't challenge it. Nope. Yeah, as he was saying that, I'm like, don't, don't. Mm, PSA, everybody. Not wise. Not wise. No. So Amy says she's going to bring in her team to remove the grandmother. Mm -hmm. And then she says Desiree, though, also needs to get therapy to get the rest of this depression out of Mm -hmm. uh, those feelings that she has over her aunt and her grandmother. Yeah. Amy's team will also remove the guy in the wash. And then the team will create a barrier around the house to keep the Wendigo and the Skinwalker at bay. Mm -hmm. You can't get rid of them, Mm -hmm. but you can keep them at bay, Mm -hmm. along with the men in the closet. They can't get rid of those guys either? No. Really? I guess not. She says, we just want to keep them the fuck out of the house. I wonder if they're tied to the land. Maybe. She didn't say they were Native American, but they certainly could have been. Mm -hmm. So the update. So I was I watched this on Discovery Plus mm-hmm. the first time, mm-hmm. and it stopped right after Amy was doing her speech, you know, where she says, I think if Desiree and Nick do what I told them to yep. do, blah, blah, blah. It cut right after that and went right to the next episode. And I'm like, whoa, hang on a minute. <laughs> Back so, it up there, Discovery Plus. Right. So I rewound and tried again. Nope, cut it off again. So I went to Hulu. Mm-hmm. And then I saw the update. So it's three weeks later, and it's a video update, and it's Nick. And he says the activity is continuing because they're still waiting for Amy's team. But it was only three weeks. Yeah. So they could still yeah. have have come. So I looked up the house. I found the house on Zillow. Mm-hmm. And it was last sold in June of 2017. Now, this aired in 2020. So that's probably so them. That was them buying the house, I'm sure. Because yep. that would have the time would have evened out yep. right. Yep. This episode, uh, so it would track with how long they have lived there. Uh, I did a property search and found out that they do still own the property. Okay, Their name so. is on the property. So hopefully this means that they took Amy's advice and all is good now. Yeah. But, you know, we can never really know that. Right. Discovery Plus, if you're hearing this, please do updates. Thank you. Love, Amy and Megan. Yes, please. Travel Channel, please do updates. So the true crime stuff for patrons, I'm just going to gloss over what, what I'm planning to do for that. Um, the Carl Martin mm-hmm. murder. This, I did a whole, I spent like a half of yesterday researching this. It was quite a doozy. <laughs> there was actually a fourth guy that was charged in this murder too. But I believe it was determined that he only helped move the body. So he ended up not going to prison. But I'll get that already. We can record that and we'll put that up. I could not find anything about the grandmother mm-hmm. because... She, I don't know her last name mm-hmm. yeah, because it's Desiree's yeah. grandmother. So I don't know yeah. that family's name. The plane crash. I do have something about the plane crash. I'm just going to put it up on Patreon. It's not that big okay. of a deal, but there's something about that. But while I was searching the family, I found an old article from 2014, 14 or 16. And it was all about their daughter, Trinity, who they never mentioned this in the episode, but she was born with a bad heart. Mm-hmm. And she had to have heart surgery, like, her second day of life, like, wow, real early. Yeah. And yeah. so she was having heart, heart surgeries all her life. And the story was about a little friend of hers at school who was trying to raise money for her uh, heart transplant. Oh. And he did that by selling little bags of his grandmother's caramel corn. Isn't that what cute? What a sweet little boy. And he raised a ton of money. He had like $17,000 or something. Damn, that's some Not good Not just on caramel corn. I, I know. You know, it got on the news and then people gave their money. But yeah. I thought that was really sweet. They should get married. Just saying. Yeah, I know. How, how meat cute is that? Right. Hallmark. And this was, 
you know, that story was yeah. she was eight in that story. Yeah. She's 13 in this. So and I couldn't find anything about anybody in this family after mm-hmm. those stories. So I I assume everything's yeah. good with them. One would hope. Yeah. They were a sweet family. Yeah. Sounds like it. Um, I sent you pictures of the Wendigo. Okay. Um, oh, God. And it was. Yeesh. Yeah. 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 Uh-uh. It looks like it's got like a. Uh, like deer antlers on top of its head. Yep. Kind of like a wolf skull. Like a like a dot, like almost like an elongated canine snout. Yeah. Yeah. I, and Google it. I don't know. I skinny, can't. skinny. Waist Skinny, and big, yeah. big shoulders, like a big long, chest. Long, long arms that yep. end in super long Ugh. fingers and claws. Oh, that's one of them is from a Stephen King wiki. I saw that, yeah. Huh, I wonder what that is. Megan, you yes. need to charge your phone. I know I do. <laughs> 17%. It always makes me anxious when I see people's phones when they send me a picture of their screenshot or whatever. And I'm like, you have to charge your phone. Because <laughs> I charge mine when it's at about... 85%. That's when I start getting nervous. Okay. I know. Well, that's you know terrible. what? You do you. I'm not judging you. This is a judge free zone. Judge free. <laughs> Hi. Hey. I'm Kristen. And I'm Jennifer. And we're the hosts of Haunted or Hoax, a paranormal investigation podcast where we investigate the legends, not the ghosts. Our locations range from houses down in Savannah, Georgia. But like how many bodies is too many bodies, you know? Probably. Are you putting a number on it? (laughs) Farmsteads up in rural New York. He just runs out into the lake and drowns himself, a la Virginia Woolf. To hotels in West Virginia. And then the next morning, he told the front desk how noisy the people in 409 were. And the staff said he was the only one on that floor. But what if he really wasn't? Like, what if they were just messing with him? Right. Like, oh, it's Adam. Let's let's fuck with him a little bit. Plus, once a month, we get together and go on a ghost tour and bring the legends and history to you. And having candy thrown off the shelves towards you sounds more like a teenager than a small child. Um, Yeah, because a small child would just stuff it right into their ghostly cheeks and run away. That's what I would do. Join us every Tuesday as we discuss the legends, history, and experiences from haunted locations. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. Bye. Bye. Okay, so mine has a trigger warning. In the okay. the history, there is infant death, um, and it's it's not oh. great. Um, not that infant death is ever like yay, but um, it's not Mm-mm. not great. So mine is called the thing. Doesn't that sound delightful? Mm-hmm. Um, and it aired on, um, let me pull up the date because I don't quite remember. Yours was 2021. I show October 30th, oh, 2021. Oh, yeah, October 30th, 2021. <gasps> That's in our birthday month. Yay. Takes place in Oxnard. Oxnard, California. Oxnard. Oxnard. I'm sorry, people. Um, and I just butchered this, your name. I didn't mean to. <laughs> So Kelly is the homeowner, and she called um, Steve in, and she thinks that whatever is in the house killed her husband and her father. The father died. He was talking, laughing, happy, she said, the way we are right now. He got a diagnosis of cancer. He went upstairs one evening, um, went to sleep, and then just didn't wake up. How old was he? He Was he, like, old, old? He was older, yeah. I don't... Okay think they cover how old he was okay um and then her late husband she found him dead in the bedroom at 45 of a drug overdose and he had been clean she said for a while and then started using and steve opens up that he lost a brother to an overdose as well he found him and Mm so to kelly and steve i just can't imagine what it would be like to find a loved one that way so my heart goes out to anybody that's had to deal with that yeah. Um, and Kelly thinks that the paranormal activity is what caused him to start using again. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Steve is like, well, why don't you just leave? And she said, well, I was my father built this house. She said I was born and raised in this house. She left. She came back eight years ago. She lives there with her daughter, Sarah, who's 15, her mother, who's 71 and herself. So there's a bed set up in the living room. And so, you know, Steve talks about that. Like, what's the story with that? And she said, well, her mother had a stroke eight years ago. She's paralyzed. She can't walk. And she said Mm. her mind isn't as sharp as she used to be. 
Ugh. And she said the past two weeks, her mother has said to her, so Kelly's mother has said to Kelly that she sees Kelly's father and her mother's father and they've come to visit her. And she said, and they said everything is going to be okay to her. And so Kelly thinks that that means her mother is is not long for this world. <laughs> Steve says, What do you think is here? I think there's a demon here. Who? Yeah. Throwing that D word around. <laughs> so we're in the main bedroom now. That's where Kelly's father passed away, she said, about a year ago. And, and Steve says, well, do you think your, your father's here? And she said, no. She said, I don't think he's here, but I'm glad that I think he's where he needs to be. Mm -hmm. And she said, after her dad had died, Kelly heard his voice saying, I'm cold, I'm cold. Heard his voice say, I'm cold, I'm cold. So I'm cold, does that mean anything to you? That's what he had told me before he was dying. And Steve said, well, are you sure it's him? And she said that she's confident that it's his voice, but she said it wasn't him. That's when she knew that this thing was evil when it was impersonating, you know, oh, people. Oh, another mimic. Yep. Said she sees shadow peoples walking through the house. Shadow figures, not peoples. Lord. Twelve and a half. Um, here's new drinking game. Whenever you hear us say shadow <laughs> figure or shadow <laughs> person, take a swig. Yep. So she said she was sleeping in Sarah's room. Sarah's her daughter, who's 15. Um, and she woke up to a large shadow standing over her, mm -hmm. touching her on the head, pushing her hair behind her oh ears. Oh, my God. Fuck. Seriously. No. Why? Uh. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. She has dreams about a demon thing. She says this demon crawls on all fours. His face is very disfigured. And um, she said he wants to hurt her physically, mentally, emotionally, all encompassing. So then Steve interviews Jennifer, who's Kelly's older daughter. Jennifer does not live there anymore. Um, and Steve is like, what do you about, you know, what do you make of this with your mom? You think she's overreacting? She goes, no, she's not overreacting at all. She's worried that something is going to happen to her. She wants her to leave. There's something here that makes people angry and makes people fight. And she said she would fight with her husband all the time. That's what caused her to move away. So in the room they were in now was like a living room. And she said she was comforting her son, who was five to six months old, because he was sick. But he wasn't feeling well. And she said all of a sudden she got punched right in the middle of her back. Oh. Steve said, you realize how dangerous that is to be punched with a newborn? She was no, like, Steve. I know, but I didn't do it on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I had no idea. I thought it was totally okay. <laughs> Then another time, um, Jennifer, again, Kelly's older daughter who doesn't live there, was washing bottles in the kitchen. And she looked up and above the sink, there's a window that you can see. Obviously, a window you can see outside. <laughs> there's a window. And in the reflection of the window, she saw a lady in a vintage nightgown. And so later on, her and her mom were looking through pictures and family photos. And she saw a picture of her and it was her mom's grandma. Okay. So then we move to Sarah and Steve. Um, Sarah's the 15-year-old, and Steve is just the best with her. Like, ugh. Steve, and he's so good with kids. Like, yeah. And with everybody. Like, if they're super, he just has such a calming demeanor about him. Yeah. You know, even though being this big, burly New York, right. Brooklyn cop, he's yeah. just super, you know, calming. I'm sure so he's, he's had to deal with a lot of victims, you know, I'm, in his yep, job. Being so. a homicide detective. Yep. Yeah. So Steve and Sarah are talking and, and he said, do you want to move? And she said, well, I wouldn't mind moving. You know, if we had to move, I wouldn't mind it. And um, she said she has horrible nightmares. And he's like, well, what's going on? And he's, she says she's being held down and she can't move in these dreams. She's being choked. Ugh. She said being suffocated is a theme and that she always wakes up scared. She was in bed one night. One time I was laying in bed right here and something came in and walked around to the other side of the bed and then got in bed with me and put their arm around me and then got up and walked out. <gasps> oh, good Lord. And Steve goes, well, you know, could it have been a dream? And she said, no, I was not dreaming. And later on, you hear in the, I believe it's in the reveal that um, Kelly says, you know, Sarah came down to breakfast the next day and asked if she got in bed with her because she felt something put her put its arm around her. Oh God! Goodbye, goodbye. Mm -hmm. I'd sleep with. I've literally slept with a Bible before because I've been so scared. 
<laughs> I've put Bibles under my pillow because <laughs> can't hurt. So now we're doing Steve's investigation. This is super interesting. So he meets with Connie Anderson, who is a local author, and they talk about the history of a cemetery. So right, I think across from the house, there's a cemetery. And it was uh, established in 1898, and it was once once a very lush, gorgeous cemetery. Um, but it's since fallen into disrepair, and it just does not like headstones are all over the place, and mm. it's just not. It's like vandalized um, and stuff. Yep, it's been vandalized. Um, the last burial was in 1949, and so since then, people have stolen headstones, and there's also been reports of weird rituals. Oh, I was gonna say, you just know people are in there with their fucking oh, yeah. Ouija boards. Of course they are. Don't fucking. So the cemetery and the it sounds like the town was established by three prominent people. The Winfield Saviors, which is a savior, the family, it's a very prominent family within this town. Like there's street signs named after them. Mm-hmm. Thomas Bard, who's a former senator, also has some street. Like we have Pillsbury yep. and yep. <laughs> all those. Yep. Um, and then Achilles Levy. So these three people or three families are kind of who started it. Originally, there was 360 people buried in the cemetery, but currently there's only about 50 or 60. So here's an interesting factoid. In 1908, they separated the cemetery. So they took 140 um, Japanese people were buried in one area. Mexican Americans were buried in another area along a tree line. They didn't want any white people buried with the other races. Like they wanted Mm -hmm. very different segregation segregation yep um and so and then that's when we find out you know the last person was buried there in 49 and that's when all the the vandalism comes Mm -hmm. and just leave the dead alone you guys i know no good comes of that ever no let them rest they deserve to rest so then we meet with Chris Conti, who's a local teacher, and he talks about the saviors. And they're a very prominent family, like I said, um, throughout the family and throughout throughout the family, throughout the, the city. Mm-hmm. So they've been there for over 100 years. The matriarch of the family, um, her name was Charlotte, and she stands out. She came from Massachusetts East. Um, remember, we're in California. So she came via Iowa in the 1880s. Um, she married Charles Saviors in 1888 with a shotgun wedding. <gasps> Scandalous. Oh, no. Oh, a shotgun wedding. <laughs> I don't know why I went south there. So <laughs> they had a total of four kids, but Jack is the only member buried in the cemetery. He's their grandson. He's their only son of Charlotte's son, Walter, and his wife. So tragedy struck poor little jack um so he was at their his grandparents playing around a wagon a bunch of hay fell off bales of hay fell off crushed his skull and broke his arm that was in 1918 he didn't die right away i was gonna say i remember this one yep he didn't die he died a week later he died february 1st of 1918 i remember that part so here's This isn't even, here's where we get the trigger warning for infant death. Um, So if you don't want to hear infant death, you might want to skip ahead. We didn't just. No, that was not the infant death. Oh, okay. Um, That was just four-year-old death. Oh. (laughs) So then we meet with Detective Mike Morastica. There was a brutal triple murder down the road from Kelly's house. And he says the murder was, what's murder always about? Revenge and money. So they were on what's called the Oxnard Family Ranch, and it was owned by Peter Fuhrer, his wife, Bertha, and Virginia, their 10-month-old daughter. The ranch was very, very successful, and Peter had hired a number of local ranch hands, including Peter, uh, I think his name was Fortune. He was one of the ranch hands that they hired. Uh, Unfortunately, he was not a good ranch hand, Mm. and so they fired him. So... The details on this are a little murky as to how he came about this, but what happened is he cashed a $250 check in Peter's name, and he was super nervous about getting caught and and going to jail. So what he did was he went back to the ranch, finds Peter in the barn, hit him with a metal pipe and killed him, hit him over the head. 
then he was like, oh, there's still some loose ends. So he went to find Bertha, killed her with the same metal pipe. Uh. She was holding the baby. Uh. You know where we're going with this. I'm not going to say it. So then he eventually moves the family to one room and lights the house on fire Mm. to try to cover. I don't know. Hide the evidence. Yeah. Sheriff brought him in. He admits the guilt, brought to trial, found guilty, sentenced to death, and was killed in like two months. Like they were not fucking yeah. around. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. You did it. You're dead. So that's Steve's portion. Yeah. Now we move on to Amy's arrival. When she arrives, she says, I don't like it. This is not a good area. Ugh. I, I don't like it. Oh, bad, 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 bad. <laughs> so then we go into, I think it was Kelly's mom's bedroom. So the living room where she is and Amy f- feels drained. She said there's a little woman living there with thin gray white hair. And she says there's no energy. She's frail. She's confused. Amy said she can't tell if she's alive or dead. But she said if she's alive, she's dying. She's not Uh, long for the mortal coil. She's heavy with confusion. She said there's lots of nausea associated with her. Feels something potentially with her heart. And she said living uh, would get sick in that room. And then she says she senses an older male who died from what she feels like was a heart attack. He owned it with his family, maybe the late 90s, 2000s, and he's frustrated. He wants out. He likes to be outside. And he's feeling like he's being pushed out or been pushed out. Um, Then she also sees a a dying woman who's looking in the mirror and talking to herself. (sighs) And she opened a gateway. And then she said she feels something that she calls the thing. The the old woman opened the gateway by talking in the mirror? I think so, yeah. And she said the thing looks burned, that it kept trying to absorb her energy. She said she thinks it can come in in and out of the mirror. The living people, their energies would be sucked. And there's dead people in the mirror as well taking their energy. Mm. And she said the scary thing is it's not just their energy. They're taking their personalities, their memories, etc. It's very negative, she said, and very, very bad. Wow. Yeah. So... Then she goes into Sarah's room and she said this person would see people coming out of the closet. There's a bunch of people that come out of the closet and just stand around the bed. She said this person is a medium and they've opened up a vortex. And so Uh, all of these dead people are coming to this person, to her too. And the person doesn't know she's a medium. Mm -mm, Doesn't know she's a medium. So she said the thing is here as well. And she said it's it's kind of morphed and changed shape to be more down to size, like scaled down. She says it has long hands. It's super skinny. And again, she says it's dangerous to the living because it can and it is taking pieces of them and taking their memories. Oh, God. So then she said, um, we're in the cemetery now. And she says she sees kind of a huge hole in the cemetery and she had to keep fight to keep herself from being sucked into the hole. <gasps> so she sees or she feels a woman present, woman presence. And she said she came from back east. She said she she got that she slept her way here. And so Amy thinks that she was a hooker, her words, not mine. And mm-hmm. she said she got that 1918 was a very important year for her. Something horrible went on that year. She heard a man barking. She's really scared. Heard something about a fire, horrible pain in her neck, horrible pain in her jaw, in her side. So maybe from getting hit with a metal pipe, throwing that away. So then we go to the reveal. And so Kelly and Jennifer are there. So Kelly is the homeowner. Jennifer's her older daughter who's moved out. And here's the first episode I saw um, where Amy was on the TV. So she wasn't in the room with them. And Amy, Oh, she was on the monitor? She was on the monitor, yeah. yep. And Amy said this was a very active walk. She talked about the deceased woman. She had an Eastern accent. She said she slept her way here, making her think that she was potentially uh, a sex worker. She mentioned the year 1918 a few times. The living may see her as a shadow. And Amy said she has a dark side. If she doesn't get her way, she lashes out to people. Hmm. 
So then Steve and Kelly kind of talk a little bit. Um, and, and Kelly says that she's seen a shadow woman standing over while she's sleeping. The bed would move and shake. And then Steve kind of talks about Charlotte, who came, you know, married the Savior's family, slept her way here, could mean a shotgun wedding. Mm. So then they're talking about the the man that they feel uh, in the living room. So the, the man that she said died suddenly from a heart attack. He's upset and frustrated. And so she said she had a sketch done of this person. And I think you have yep. pictures Yep. They show it, and it looks exactly like her brother Danny, who passed away at the age of 55 in 2008, and he's still there. So he's, you know, he hasn't moved on yet. So the picture is just a guy who looks to be, I don't know, 50, yeah. maybe? And he's got real rosy cheekbones. Not rosy, I shouldn't say. It's black and white, but um, like real prominent cheekbones mm-hmm. and mustache. He's balding, so he's only got the hair on the sides. Yep. And then he's wearing like a tank top that looks like it might be plaid or something. Checkered. Yep. Okay. And that's her brother. That's her brother, Danny. Yep. Okay. So then she talks about the older female who's not deceased, but maybe dying. Mm. And she said there's something going on with the heart. And so that's when Kelly says that her mother went in for the op- for open heart surgery. And that's when she suffered her stroke. Uh. Yeah. One, two punch. Jesus. Yeah. So she said she sees a younger woman looking into a mirror with a candle and she inadvertently opened a doorway through the mirror. I wish she'd sketched that. Yeah, I know. Right. I know. (laughs) Never sketches the good stuff. Just kidding. She does. So she said quite a few dead people hang out in the mirrors that it's very concerning. She said they draw energy in. They draw, you know, they're stealing energy. And she said, and that's what makes them negative. And she said, you may see people in the mirrors. You may catch movement out of the corner of your eye. You may see a reflection. And that's when Jennifer said she saw the reflection in the window of her great grandmother. The kitchen, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then she starts talking about the thing and she calls it the thing. And then Kelly said, that's interesting because that's exactly what I call it too, is the thing. (sighs) And she said it was never alive. Its skin was very burned. It's not good. It's very, very bad. And it takes energy. And that's when Kelly says, you know, I'm lethargic. I'm tired. I'm just drained all the time. And Amy said it it can um, pick pieces of your personality, pick your memories out. And Amy asks if anybody in the house is having memory problems. And then Jennifer and Kelly look at each other and, and <laughs> Steve's like, share share with the class. <laughs> Jennifer <laughs> says that Kelly is totally different. She's not herself. She gets very mad very easily. It's just not like her. Mm-hmm. So then she talks about Sarah's room and she said the person in that room has abilities. She said there's another vortex in the closet because of her abilities. The dead are coming from the closet and they're surrounding the bed and <sighs> uh, it's dead people who want help. And so the thing got much smaller and she said it was crawling in the bed with them. And she does have a sketch done of that. And it's a, okay. a girl in, in a bed and you can see a bunch of people around the bed. Mm-hmm. Kind um, of dark figures. Dark figures, yep. Or in and dark then, clothing anyway. And then you see something with very long arms, long skinny fingernails, kind of almost like an alien type head were very round Mm -hmm. Um, kind of a longer face crawling into bed with this person that's sleeping. No, thank you. That's a creepy picture. It's so creepy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting that you said when you talked about your story about Amy wanting things to be done repeatedly throughout the year because she wanted that done here too. Uh So she said, you can stay, but there are a lot of things that need to be done first. Uh Amy will bring in a group of sensitive and mediums to move Danny, her brother, uncomfortably. She said, he's ready to go. He wants to go. She did say the house did not have anything to do with her father and her husband's death because they did ask that. Yeah. She said, you need to close the large vortex. You need to shut it sever it, seal it, and also close the vortex in Sarah's room. They both need to be shut. To keep the thing out, you need to buy a large bag of salt 
and put mm-hmm. it around the barrier of her property, she said. Mm-hmm. The shadow woman will be pushed out. She said, I want the barrier redone every two weeks for wow. a year. Can you imagine anybody actually doing that? Don't you think you'd be like, eh, it's fine. <sighs> I haven't seen anything in a while. It's fine. I I don't know. Being me, I probably would do it for the rest of my life. I think I would get lazy. (laughs) Um, So the update is Kelly's waiting for the team to arrive and the activity continues. Oof. Those sketches were creepy. Yep. Yep. They are creepy. I'll make sure those are on the socials. And I did find a little bit of information about the killing. We can do that in a Patreon episode, but I did find a little bit more um, information on it. Okay, cool. Thank you for joining us for another episode of The Activity Continues. We hope you had fun, and please feel free to drop us a note at theactivitycontinues at gmail.com or PM us on all of our socials. We love to hear from you. What Dead Files episode should we cover next? Or you can send us your paranormal stories and we'll read them on the show. Have a great week and we'll see you next time when the activity continues. continues. The Activity Continues podcast is produced by me, Amy, at Collected Sounds Media and is a part of the independent Collected Sounds podcast network. Nailed it.